Who can tell me the formula for conditional probability? Just a good old boy Never meaning no harm Beats all you never saw Been in trouble with the law Since the day they was born Straightening the curve How y'all doing? Doing uh, pretty good. I'm here on a rainy uh, uh, Thursday. It's pouring down the rain outside. Can't work. Nothing on TV. Uh, nothing to do. Drago's sleeping as he normally does. Oh wait, here, here he comes. <laughs> he heard his name. <laughs> he knows I have shamed him on YouTube. What? Come here. Uh, come on. Yeah, he, he he just doesn't obey anything. Then uh, I'm here with uh, Drago, uh, my aforementioned dog, and we also have Brad, our shape shifting vision casting leader. So we have the three of us here uh, for your <laughs> for your <laughs> viewing entertainment. <clears throat> well, aren't you three just the sorriest excuses for superheroes? <laughs> Say, guess the uh, TVC music from the intro and you'll win a prize. Tell them what they'll win, Brad. If you missed the uh, TVC music from the uh, the Prosperity uh, video we did with the uh, Prosperity Gospel with the uh, John Beneffel video, um, here's the answer. <laughs> So, um, today we're going to be listening to a terrible thing someone said. Just, it's just so terrible. But this is the channel where we listen to terrible things, but um, we listen uh, with our Bibles open, with the Word of God, with the voice of our shepherd to uh, comfort us. And uh, so, we're not afraid of the terrible things, but they do evoke... Uh, a particular reaction from us, uh, as they should, uh, because we have the Holy Spirit of Christ uh, inside of us, and so when we hear these terrible things about Christ, um, we we rightly re react with uh, disgust and um, revulsion. Sometimes it's hard, and this one is is hard. So uh, I had to kind of fortify myself uh, before I even looked at it. So I, I thought, you know, before we look at the most terrible thing, we look at some, maybe some lesser terrible things. I don't know. I don't know how you gauge these terrible things. I just know how they make me feel. And so I thought, you know, why not just uh, empty the vault of weird things people say? So we'll have sort of an extended, uh, extended, uh, session of weird things people say I just whatever I've got in the folder we'll just empty it out here on this program and then maybe we'll be ready to look at the most weirdest <laughs> and most terriblest uh, thing of all this this is probably the, the worst thing I've, I've I've seen since I started doing this but anyway um, so before that we'll look at some other weird things and so um, here we go and I thought of those angels circling that throne, and I thought, I bet they text each other. What a dumb trick. This is the dumbest trick. Why don't you ever call me dumb again? It can be naughty. God likes naughty, so that's... I need you to be focused. I execute judgment on you, COVID-19! Oh, um, just when I think you couldn't possibly be any dumber. And Jesus starts to weep, and he says, please forgive me. That doesn't make sense. we got to read some scripture to make this legal. I'm already accused of being a cult leader. i got to... I gotta, I gotta at least use the Bible. Something is happening I don't quite understand. Sometimes I get sermons off of Gatorade commercials and... Roses are blue, violets are red. Today I will be taught the word of God. So, 
So first we have uh, Judah Smith of uh, of uh, Churchill, and uh, well, he, here we go. Um, and we're going to go again to this book like we do every single time we gather. Hey, if you're new to this space, I'm Judah. Like I said, I'm married to a woman named Chelsea. We've been married 21 years. We have three kids. We get to lead here as the lead pastors of Church Home. And we are a mobile church. We're a technological community around the world. And thank you. Wherever, you know, maybe it's not a Sunday. Maybe it's a Monday. Maybe it's a Wednesday. Maybe it's a Friday night. Maybe it's in the middle of the night that you're dialing up this content and you're watching this, you are on God's mind constantly. And contrary to popular notion and cultural connotations, God is not mad at you. He loves you. That is just a, just, just a weird thing to say. I mean, how does Judah know who God is mad at and who he's not? And he's just talking to anyone here. I mean, he said, hey, if you're new to here, you're just dialing up. You're just some, I don't know, maybe psycho killer in your basement, uh, some pedophile somewhere or uh, whatever, you know, whoever you are. You know, if you're logging in here and watching me speak to you, then then God's not mad at you. Now, he loves you. Now, you said, uh, you know, they, they take the Bible every day and they teach from it. And um, the, the Bible teaches that, that God is, in fact, mad. The Bible says that he feels indignation for the wicked every day. He has wrath for sin every moment of every day. And if you are not in Christ, that wrath is upon you. Yes, indeed, his mind is upon you and it is to destroy you. Jesus says this in John 3. Now, does that mean that if you are in Christ that God doesn't get mad at you? Well, not in the same way, but he does get mad in a sense. He corrects and chastens those, those whom he loves. The Bible says in Hebrews 12, 6, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves. Uh, for the Lord, lo for whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges everyone, every son he receives. Um, so God does get angry in a sense, in the same way that our parents get angry at us when we disobey. It's just a, it's just a very weird thing to say. A lost person tuning in will think, hey, me and God are cool. A saved person in a particular sin or perhaps struggling with a decision like, for example, I don't know, should I leave my husband and break up our family? They'll hear this cool preacher looking them right in the eye saying, God's not mad at you. It's impossible for God to be mad at you. It's, it's, just, it's very irresponsible, Judah, and very weird. All right, so next up, we've got this clip from this guy. I, I don't remember who it was. Some guy hollering something, some preacher somewhere. I, I forgot to save it with a name. But uh, anyway, here it is, and it's it's pretty weird. I speak in tongues, and I know how to cuss in English. Did you mean for all those words to come out together, or did they just fall out randomly? Yeah, uh, no real comment there. That's just, <laughs> that's just weirdness that you can't even... Uh, <laughs> talk about. Uh, next up, we've got Pastor McCon Carter, uh, made famous by Stephen Furtick, and he's going to be saying something pretty weird. If I got sick, if I couldn't preach, if cancer hit my body, if I got in a car accident, our church would still go on because it doesn't need me. I've been the visionary. I set the culture. I set the DNA. But I can hand this microphone to anyone on our team, and they can do it just as good as us. As a matter of fact, on the weeks that I don't preach, just as many people get saved, just as many people show up, just as many people get signed up to get baptized, just as many people. I haven't done a baptism. I don't know how many, how long, maybe a couple years, and thousands of people have got baptized in our church. Uh, and before, when we first started doing that, pastor's not going to baptize me? No, because pastor's not the fix-all. I don't know what's the matter with the general. Something up here. Right, he's just the he's just the visionary who sets the culture and sets the DNA. Maybe people in your church act a little lost when you take a sick day because you tell them things like you're the visionary, you set the culture, and you set the DNA. He's like John Hammond, you know. He just plants the DNA and then lets the dinosaur machine run its course. He's a digger. Yeah, that, that would be Christ, who's who's the visionary, who sets the culture, who uh, sets the DNA, or, or, or whatever that means. Uh, Christ, not you, McCon. Um, so next up, we have um, 
Oh, we have uh, a Bill Johnson uh, of Bethel Church, and he's saying something uh, pretty weird. Um, I know that may come as a shock to you, but uh, Bill Johnson of Bethel Church is prone to saying weird things. I remember my, my brother on the streets of San Francisco once. He had he was uh, getting this group young group, uh, group of young people together. He was sending them out onto the streets. To, some were going to go uh, give out blankets and and uh, that sort of thing. Others were going to go pray for the sick. Others were going to go preach and they had different things assignments. So he was dividing up the group. And one guy was walking by. He didn't know the guy was just walking past. He just thought he was part of the youth group. So he says, "And you, I want you to go with this group here." So here's this guy who's a law student that was just walking by. <laughs> And he was just curious by this large man, my brother's six foot six, he was this large man barking out orders to young people. And so he just, he just, he went. He, he, went, with, he, went, with the group. He, he, he went with the group. And he was on the team that was to lay hands on the sick and, uh, and pray for them to be healed. And so he did. And he, he watched Jesus heal people. And he came back and wanted to meet this Jesus that he had been partnering with to see people healed. And he got born again. Uh, what did you just say, Bill? And he came back and wanted to meet this Jesus that he had been partnering with to see people healed. And he got born again. I, I don't... I don't pretend to understand this stuff. I'm just, I'm fascinated by Jesus' process. These disciples belong before they believe. Bill, if I wanted to work things out, I would have called. So Jesus apparently partners with the with lost people, uh, fills them with his spirit to, to heal people. Um, who knew? Uh, next up, we have uh, Christine Kane. Uh, this is part of her shtick. <laughs> she has a really weird shtick that she goes through uh, every time she speaks. Uh, she really needs to get some new material. All right, turn. The ones on the floor, you face that way. The ones up there, you go that way. You guys, and now put your hands on the shoulders of the chick in front of you and give her the best massage you have ever given her in your life. That's it. <laughs> nice and strong. Okay, go down her spine. Pinch her cheeks. I will not. <laughs> you can do it in your groups at home as well. This is your moment. All right, now turn around and you pay them back with equal fervor, equal passion. <laughs> Right, you go down her spine. You can pinch whatever cheek you want. It's like not cool. Not cool. It's like a weird thing to say in church, <laughs> don't you think? Oh, and and here's another one. It's another one. I, I forgot the preacher's name, but um, he he seems to have a really weird take on uh, on evangelism. Before I go into my official honor of your leadership, I need you to do me a favor. Let's demonstrate some online outreach. How do you do that? By simply pressing share. The moment you press share, you invite all of your family, your friends, your followers to church. This is church. Even though it may be a virtual platform, it's an opportunity for us to worship together. So press share right now. A lot of us are too nervous to go up to people at the gas station or we don't want to knock on doors. So you can do it the easy way and just simply press share. This is way too easy. Who knew it was so easy? <laughs> uh, okay, so who we got? Okay, uh, this is Bill Johnson again, and he's saying something weird. Um, Bill Johnson contradicts himself a lot. Uh, he's a bundle of contradictions. One of his favorite things to say is, is uh, in, in order to prove that um, God doesn't cause suffering anymore, uh, is, he, is he says... How many storms did Jesus bless? And then he drops the mic and walks away like it's some settled, um, you know, uh, theological point. But we don't really determine truth that way by, by a negative, by what Scripture doesn't say, especially in the narratives. I mean, think about it. Um, how many storms did Jesus bless? None. Well, boom. God doesn't call storms. Well, how many times did Jesus scratch his foot? How many times did Jesus sleep on his back? How many times did Jesus start a seminary? How many times did Jesus preach from the book of Amos? So are we to conclude that we're not to preach from the book of Amos? It's, uh, it's ridiculous. But then that's, that's uh, Bill Johnson. 
it says that Jesus healed all who were oppressed of the devil. Everyone that Jesus, that the Father sent him to was healed, 100%. And everyone who came to him was healed. But not everyone who was sick on the planet was healed. Right? In Acts 3, we have Peter and John walking to the gate beautiful, and they see a lame man who's been there for years. The implication is he was there when Jesus walked there. But for whatever reason, he didn't cry out, or the Father didn't lead Jesus to him. We don't know how, we don't know why, we just know that he was alive in the same city as Jesus when Jesus was healing people. Many believers make what I think is a huge mistake in creating theology around what didn't happen. Jesus, he, didn't, he never blessed any storms. Many believers make what I think is a huge mistake in creating theology around what didn't happen. Never once was he sitting in a boat with hurricane force winds and he says, just go to that city, destroy them, it'll humble them, then they'll pray and they'll become like me. Theology around what didn't happen. But Jesus never said that, he never did. What didn't happen. How many storms did Jesus bless? What didn't happen. How many storms did he face? With his disciples in the boat, life-threatening storm, and he just blessed that storm. Go destroy that city. And after they're destroyed, it'll humble them. They'll become more like me. Many believers make what I think is a huge mistake in creating theology around what didn't happen. You never see Jesus using, creating crisis to bring about change. What didn't happen. Illogical. So next up, we've got uh, Pastor Larry Breeze. He's a disciple of um, uh, Stephen Furtick and uh, Elevation Church. And uh, he's going to be saying something but, yeah, pretty weird. And I'm excited to, to open up God's word with everyone today. And it's less of a sermon and more of just kind of like an insight into my journal for what God's been doing in my life. I could quote you a few theologians to give you an argument on that. And uh, next up, we have... Uh, McCon uh, Carter again is going to be saying some uh, weird and I personally think uh, offensive things, but uh, you know, you be the judge. Woo! I know what it's like to be stuck in the middle. A lot of people think I'm Latino. I'm not Latino. I mean, I love beans and rice and Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody. <laughs> but I'm not Latino at all. Carne asada. Come on, bring it on. Menudo. Let's, let's get it. But man, I'm, I'm, I'm half black and half white, and I'm like the extremes of black and white. I mean, my mama is hillbilly, hee-haw. All my uncles got like two teeth white. Yay, white people. I'm for real, man. My daddy's black, black. Jerry curl, purple Kool-Aid, fried chicken, TCB, pink oil. Come on, somebody. Velvet black Jesus on the wall. Black nativity scene. So I'm half hood and half hillbilly. I'm hoodbilly, y'all. Come on, somebody. Y'all don't know about me. Yeah, I think we've we've got a pretty good pretty good idea about you, uh, uh, McCon. Uh, you're the kind of person who thinks you know one of the one of the major characteristics of white people is that they don't have many teeth. Now, granted, <laughs> some of us don't, but again, uh, I'm not sure this is really indicative of um, Christian uh, opinion on these matters. I don't know. But I'm just uh, All right, so let's, let's close it out with um, Christine Kane again saying something weird, and then we'll go to the weirdest, most uh, terrible thing uh, that I've seen in quite a while. It's to everyone, wherever you are, anywhere in the world, big shout out to all the ones watching from Australia. If gathering, I kind of feel like I've been woven into the fabric of this seven years ago before If Was If. Um, Jenny Allen, who was like a crazy woman, and she's just gone to new realms of crazy over seven, um, would just talk my ear off about this dream, and which has now become a movement, 25 countries, two and a half thousand locations. You all have become a bit like God, omnipresent. Um, that's what happens. It's just like if is everywhere you're like freaking out a bit this is what well maybe it is stupid but it's also dumb all right so here we go here's the most uh, weirdest uh, thing uh and most terrible thing uh get ready it's coming from dr uh george carl one of the um one of the new apostles the new prophets of god so here we go 
Hi, this is George Carl, and I want to tell you about a powerful encounter I had with the Lord just a few years ago in order to encourage you also to experience your own encounters with the Lord. So this is um, to encourage me to have my own encounters with the Lord, um, whatever that means. So I was just sitting in my office at my desk and I was turning around into the middle of the room and there was standing Jesus just in the middle of the room uh, looking at me and... Jesus is apparently from um, Spooner, Wisconsin. It's, it's the all-American Jesus. And starting to smile and as he smiled, I also started to smile. Now, um, the Apostle John, an actual apostle, one of those sent personally by Jesus to teach us believers in Jesus all about Jesus, had a bit of a different reaction when he saw Jesus. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp, two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And this from someone who had known Jesus intimately here on the earth. This is John, the beloved disciple, the one loved by Jesus. Yeah. I'm just saying he, he reacted this way for a reason. And the Holy Spirit recounts his reaction to us for a reason. What would that be, do you think? And then he started bursting out in a kind of a laughter. So I also started bursting out in a kind of a laughter. And it got even worse. He, he, he started laughing wildly and uh, slapping his knees. And I was also slapping my knees like this with him. It was really a hilarious sight, I believe, uh, watching the two of us just, just bursting out in laughter together. And uh, so as I was watching him, I, I thought, well, he, he even looks a little drunk there. What? He, he even looks a little drunk there. So, so I asked Jesus and I, and I told him and said, uh, in heaven, Lord, are you, are you also getting drunk in heaven? And Jesus answered me, yes, we are always drunk in heaven. We are drunk on the love of the Father. We are drunk on the joy of the Father. And we are also drunk on the peace of the Father. So. So, so how does this edify me to know that in heaven Jesus is staggering around like a drunk man? Is this the image we see of him portrayed in scripture? Uh, Isaiah says, uh, while he was on earth, he was a man of sorrows and, and well acquainted with sorrows and, and grief. Um, now look, we know Christ through the scriptures. When you read uh, the first epistle of John, uh, he tells us this. John starts out by saying, we've seen him, we've experienced him, we've known him intimately here on the earth. You have not, you have not seen him, but we have seen him. And now we are telling you about him and that's enough. That is enough. That is all you need. Jesus told his apostles, you go tell the world about me and they will believe through your words, right? It pleases the Father for us to believe in Christ through the words of his witnesses, his apostles that he chose and sent to us with that message. So we see Christ in scriptures. And anyone who knows Christ when we see Christ in scriptures, for instance, when we're doing our Bible study on Thursday nights, looking at Christ in the Old Testament, how our hearts burn within us uh, when we see him there. 
because that's how it pleases the Father to reveal him to us. Uh, we're basing it on uh, Jesus walking down the Emmaus Road in Luke 24, where he sees two of his disciples, those who knew him on the earth, and those who were saddened because he had died. And he came back, and they didn't even recognize him. They didn't recognize him until Jesus showed them himself in the scriptures. And then it says, did not our hearts burn within us while he was here with us, teaching us the scriptures? Um, and, and when we who are believers in him, who have been converted through the power of the words of the apostles, the testimony of God's words in the Bible, when we read him in scripture, our hearts burn within us when we see him there. We're, we're reading and we're like, that's Christ. That's our God. That's our Savior, our Redeemer. Now, when we hear things like this that are not in the word, that this uh, guy sees Jesus and he's staggering around like a drunk man. Yeah, it doesn't. Our hearts don't burn within us. Our hearts feel, feel uh, revulsion and rightly so. Because this is how we were taught. We were taught by Christ himself to see him in the scriptures. And we will see him one day. We will. Our eyes will behold him. But we have to be sanctified here on the earth. And we are sanctified by the word of God. Uh, this is what Jesus said when he prayed for us. He said, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And this is not the word of truth. It's not the word of God. It's weird. Everything that is not the word of God is just is just weird. And uh, I don't I don't know what else to say. Hey, y'all, it's me again. <laughs> it's a few days later, obviously, uh, went to a motel in uh, Johnson City, Tennessee, the great metropolis, uh, doing some work here uh, out of town. Uh I've been thinking about this video, you know, for a couple of days after I made it. It's like, like, I mean, I know why this video was so terrible to me, but why, like, why it was just so uh, offensive to me, just, <laughs> just terrible. I mean, I've looked at some really terrible things, but we've looked at some terrible things together. But this, what George Carl said to me, just really affected me. And uh, I couldn't figure out why. Why was this so much more terrible than other things that I've heard or looked at? And I think uh, two reasons. Uh, first of all, just, just the idea of Jesus. I, I mean, I, I can hardly even bring myself to say it, but the idea of Jesus being drunk. You know, some of us who were drunks um, know the, the, the just utter indignity and just wickedness of that i mean that feeling i drunkenness is 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 evil it's an evil thing to be not in control of yourself in that way and, and those of us who remember the things we've done when we were drunk it's just so offensive to say such a thing about uh our lord it's just it really is revolting but another thing, and I think even more egregious, is the fact that George Carl and these other people, you know, they say they get to see Jesus, right? You and I want to see him, but but we don't get to see him. Um, the people in the first century church uh, that the Apostle John wrote to, they wanted to see Jesus, um, but they didn't get to. You know, John starts his epistle by saying, uh, we've seen him. The apostles, we've seen him, we've touched him, we've lived with him, we know him in the personal sense, in the sense that uh, we know people here on the earth. We've touched him, these hands have touched him, these eyes have seen him. He goes on to say no one has seen God at any time. But, as he said in his gospel, but Jesus revealed God to us. The apostles got to see Jesus. The people John was writing to didn't get to see Jesus, that's what he's saying. You guys haven't seen him, but we, the apostles, are here to tell you about him. So they, they wanted to see Jesus, but none of them got to. Um, believers for 2,000 years have wanted to see Jesus, and, and, and they haven't gotten to. I mean, think about um, Hebrews chapter 11, uh, how it ends, where it talks about all these Old Testament people who had faith in Christ. 
and it says, but they, they did not receive the promise. They did not receive uh, what they had been hoping for, had faith for, which was to see Christ. But the writer says that uh, God had something better in mind for them, that they would see him when we see him, that we would all see him together, the whole family, all of us together, all of us together seeing him as one, all of us, one from every nation, one from every tribe, from every tongue, all of us together will behold Christ together as a family. Nobody gets a sneak peek. We all see him together as a family, one bride for one good and perfect husband. I mean, now we know that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, but we're also told that those who die in Christ, they don't die, they, they go to sleep. And uh, we all know when you go to sleep, it's like no time has passed at all. So we're talking in terms of eternity here. So, so I believe what, what is, 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 is implied here by Hebrews is that uh, those who die now go to sleep. They wake up and they see Christ. They wake up and we're all there uh, beholding Christ together. But the point is we all see him together. Everybody's waiting to see him. Um, those who have died are waiting to see him with us. They're waiting for us to get there. Abraham waiting for us. Paul's waiting for us. All our family, our physical family here on the earth who died in the Lord, waiting for us to get there. It, it really is a family reunion. A family of God seeing Christ together. Um, but these guys running around, they're, no, we, we got to see him first. We're, we're the special sons. We're afforded special privileges in the family. And that's really what they want you to think, that, that there's something special about them, because even though we want to see our Lord, they get to see him. And uh, it's just terrible. It's terrible. 